Good afternoon, guys, and welcome back to the Suburban Proletarian. My name is Greg, and today's video has been a long time in the offing. I am, of course, today talking about my Zodiac Super Seawolf uh, 68 Saturation, which I received as a Christmas present from my wife almost a year ago now. It's the middle of uh, November, and I've been wearing it off and on for about... 11 months. It's been in my daily rotation. I haven't just saved this for special occasions, although it's a very special watch. I've been wearing it to work and, and I've been wearing it in the outdoors and I just, so far I just love this watch. And more importantly, I love Zodiac and I have for a very long time. Um, I originally tried to make this video a couple of times by talking about the full history of Zodiac and uh, as it relates to and really because Zodiac was part of the inception of the history of the modern dive watch I wanted to go all the way back to 1952 and start with that whole story but there's so much information out there online there's really no good reason for me to make this video extra long by talking about all of that so let me just talk a little bit about why I fell in love with Zodiac long 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 time before i could ever have thought of actually buying a zodiac and that is partly due to the fact that while i could not really imagine being able to afford to get myself a zodiac um, zodiacs were a bit less expensive than the competition from rolex and omega actually they were significantly less expensive although they have pretty much the same dna and the same depth of roots when it comes to dive watches anyway as uh, Rolex or Omega. They were significantly less expensive. Rolex was sort of the establishment brand. Um, Omega kind of followed along closely behind. Uh, they were the establishment white collar brands. They were the ones with the big uh, military contracts and government contracts. They were the ones that had cultivated relationships with um, professional exploration organizations like the National Geographic um, and Zodiac was always kind of a little bit behind kind of nipping at the heels kind of bucking the trend um, but they were I always saw Zodiac as sort of being the the blue-collar heroes answer to Rolex uh, during the Vietnam War uh, the Zodiac the original Zodiac Sea Wolf and then later the Super Sea Wolf this came out in 1968, so it was sort of towards the end of the war. Uh, but Zodiac watches were available for sale through the military exchange program. Around the time of the last few years of the 1960s, you could buy a Rolex uh, Submariner from the PX for about 180 bucks. Um, I think you could get a, an Omega Seamaster for maybe 10 to $20 less than that, so uh, $140, $160. And at that time, the Zodiac watches were also available through the PX system. And, but you could get one of those for less than $100, I think about $80 or $90. So like half of the price of a Rolex. That was still a really expensive watch. But as a result of that, uh, guys that were deploying to Vietnam, particularly uh, it became popular, the Zodiac Seawolf became popular with uh, Navy SEALs and Army Green Berets who needed a good, rugged, waterproof watch to deal with the very wet and humid environment of Vietnam. Uh, a lot of them ended up buying Zodiac Seawolves. Uh, the Rolex and Omega watches were seen more as uh, private purchase items for officers. Uh, certainly some enlisted guys ended up buying Rolexes and Omegas. But I think by far, that was one of the biggest success stories for Zodiac. And as a result of that, I ended up reading uh, articles in um, magazines like Soldier of Fortune. And I fairly early on read books that were about the Navy SEALs and Mac V SOG and all of that stuff in, in Vietnam. And oftentimes you heard mention of the Zodiac Seawolf. It just it gained a reputation that way. And as an impressionable young guy reading stories, you know, of these warriors fighting a war in an exotic land halfway around the world and doing all kinds of covert operations and stuff like that, that was really exciting to me. And on the other hand, I was far too young to be cognizant of 
uh, all of the political controversy going around the war. Uh, I just saw adventure stories and uh, I imprinted upon Zodiac. And another factor in the formation of my fascination with Zodiac was the advertising. Because companies like Rolex and Zodiac, although they were building watches to uh, more or less the same purpose, they were, in fact, as I've already pointed out, kind of serving two different markets. So their advertising was much, much different. And of course, I loved Rolex. Rolex was cool. I was a big James Bond fan. You know, who doesn't want to be James Bond when they're a kid? And uh, so, of course, I was fascinated with the Rolex Submariner and later on with the uh, Omega Seamaster. Um, but let's just take a look. I've printed out a few advertisements here from the two different companies, and I'll show you the difference in how the two companies, Rolex specifically I'm talking about, and Zodiac, promoted their watches. So, first of all, I, I'll throw this up right here so you can uh, get a little bit better look at it. We've got a Rolex ad, I'm guessing from the early 1960s. We've got either a shirtless Gregory Peck or a shirtless Gregory Peck lookalike. It doesn't name Gregory Peck in here, but that sure looks like Gregory Peck to me. And as I said, he's shirtless. He's at the helm of his sailing yacht and... He's wearing his Rolex Submariner here. And the ad copy uh, starts off by listing various racing achievements and the fact that Royal Navy divers uh, use the Rolex Submariner. And um, Jacques Picard uh, had a, another version of the Rolex Submariner with him when he went down on the Bathyscaphe Trieste to explore the bottom of the Marianas Trench. All very impressive achievements, but they also go on to point out that someone like Gregory Peck, who's sailing on the weekends, uh, now it's being worn in places where the wettest thing around is a dry martini. And they make it very clear that although the Rolex is very rugged and very waterproof and, and very adventure ready, it's an aristocratic watch for aristocratic people. Um, fully luminous to be read in the dark of the cockpit or in the shadows of the cocktail bar. Mm. Only the Submariner has the features you need underwater or in the high spots. So they were definitely courting. I, I've seen people say, well, Rolex wasn't always the luxury mark that it is today. There's no doubt that all the way back to the 1950s and 60s, Rolex was definitely courting an aristocratic clientele. Uh, here's another Rolex advertisement from Yachting Magazine. I think this one is from the late 1950s. And you can see we've got a salty old sea captain here. And they go on to talk about how Rolex was the first uh, to produce a waterproof wrist chronometer in 1926. And you just look at this photograph. I mean, this guy is just the picture of one of Her Majesty the Queen's royal servants. Um, he looks adventure ready. He's got his beard and his pea coat, but he also looks very conservative and very trustworthy. I mean, this is the guy who's going down with the ship. Uh, on the bridge with his pipe clamped in his teeth and a stiff upper lip as the ship slips beneath the foamy waves and of course after having rescued all of his passengers. And this guy is cool in his own way but he's very very square. Speaking of square, here's the last Rolex advertisement I'd like to take a look at. Pan Am flies with Rolex. Um, it's certainly no secret some of you uh, no doubt know that the, uh, the Rolex GMT Master was built, designed and built to the exact specifications of Pan American Airways. Uh, it says here, an airline's reputation depends upon its efficient scheduling. Pan American World Airways, the world's most experienced airline, is no exception. And that is why Rolex has been chosen as their official timepiece. So here we've got another 
official Rolex wearer. And uh, just take a look at this guy. Pan Am flight officer. He's on the, the bridge. Uh, presumably a co-pilot or navigator. And he's looking through some sort of periscopic transit to, I guess, ostensibly take celestial navigation readings. And he's doing the timing with his Rolex GMT Master. And much like the salty sea captain, this guy is really square. I mean, look at that haircut. And very dependable. This is the kind of guy who's going to stay at the yoke and fly the airplane right into the side of a mountain to make sure that all of his passengers have time to bail out. Um, and another cool guy, but hmm, not very adventurous, let's say. Now let's take a look at Zodiac's advertising. And Zodiac didn't run glossy full-page ads in magazines like Vanity Fair and National Geographic. They were usually smaller, black and white, um, quarter-page ads, somewhere in the middle of the magazine, towards the back, and in publications like Soldier of Fortune and Playboy. And uh, this is a very typical ad. This is one that I saw many, many times in my youth. And this guy is not a Pan Am pilot, and he's not a salty sea captain. He is a treasure hunter, probably at the bottom of the Adriatic Sea or the Mediterranean Sea. And he and his cohorts are hauling sunken treasure up off the bottom. He's got a Amphiora uh, shouldered there and uh, a little snorkel stuffed through his... Uh, weight belt and uh, you know a dagger style dive knife there and he's uh, he's not a sea captain this guy is an adventurer and uh, what does it say here uh, this goes back to Vietnam this would this ad probably ran about the time of the Vietnam War and it says here it has also proved val extremely valuable for everyday use especially in tropical countries so Definitely courting that sort of military adventure sort of thing. Uh, here's another Zodiac ad. This one's actually from the 1990s. This is from the Willy Gadmonier uh, period, which I'm not going to get into Zodiac's whole history, but you can look that up. And it says here, it's official. And there's a picture of a Zodiac Super Sea Wolf here. And... There's a, there's a, uh, uh, the seal of the Underwater Demolition Team Seal Association, Naval Special Warfare. And um, this ad seems to suggest that the Zodiac Super Sea Wolf is the official watch of the Navy SEALs. In fact, it was the official watch of the Underwater Demolition Team Seal Association. This is a fraternal organization, much like the Fraternal Order of Police or whatever, to support SEALs and their families, particularly after their service is over. But it goes on to say, used by the U.S. Navy Frogmen, U.S. Navy SEALs. Uh, it also says that the watch is water-resistant from 300 feet to 3,000 feet. I don't know what exactly that's meant to mean, but it didn't have any effect on my... I mean, if you read this, it looks like it's not water-resistant at less than 300 feet, which... Doesn't seem like a very ringing endorsement, but um, it was certainly uh, certainly had a big effect on me, even though I would have been not a kid, probably in my 20s when I saw this ad, but not lost on me. And here we have the be-all and end-all of Zodiac advertisements. This one, again, not from my childhood. Um, this was printed in 1994, so I would have been 25 years old, but still young still impressionable and still jonesing for my first you know real swiss watch i mean look at this advertisement it has absolutely everything here so here we've got a shirtless guy again it's not gregory peck though this guy's no gregory peck and he is wrestling with a snake and from the coloration and the fact that he appears to be waist deep in some amazonian estuary we can assume that this is an anaconda 
But it's not just any old anaconda. It's wrapped around him and it's fighting him. But this is the world's only venomous anaconda. I mean, this thing has a big old f off set of uh, rattlesnake fangs. So clearly this is a life or death struggle. And the guy has what appears to be an STG-57 bayonet clamped in his teeth. And he's locked eyes with this snake. And he's planning on stabbing this snake in the face with his face. And of course he's wearing his Zodiac uh, Super Seawolf here. Very prominently displayed in the photo, as it should be in an advertisement. And he thinks so much of his Zodiac watch. Not only is he wearing it, he's got the Zodiac emblem tattooed on his forearm. I mean, this guy doesn't play by anybody's rules. He's no, he's no Pan Am navigator. He doesn't know the intricacies, the social intricacies of a cocktail bar. You know, this guy drinks his rot gut whiskey uh, straight from the bottle in some tin shack saloon that's situated very precariously on the bank of some tropical river. I mean. When he's not shirtless and wrestling snakes in a river, I imagine he dresses like Indiana Jones. So you can see why this sort of advertising had a real effect on me. Because when you're a kid, would you rather be the salty old sea captain or would you rather be Indiana Jones? I know which one I'd rather be. And as a result of all of that, I became a big Zodiac fan. And as I said, I was very excited when Zodiac reintroduced the Super Sea Wolf a couple of years ago. And I've, I have had one for almost a year now, and you're probably getting really sick and tired of listening to me talk. So let's go over and take a look at this watch on the tabletop. All right, guys, so here it is, the Zodiac Super Sea Wolf 68 Saturation. Um, let me get some of the particulars out of the way uh, right off the bat before I forget them. It's 45 millimeters um, across the bezel ring, and I chose the bezel ring because it stands a little bit proud of the case. Um, it doesn't have traditional lugs, so I'll just tell you that from end to end the case is 50 millimeters and it stands 16 millimeters high. So this is a big watch, but because of the sort of oval shape of the case back, uh, the fact that the case rises up here towards the edges, um, the technical term for that is escaping me at the moment, the watch doesn't really wear super large. When you've got it on your wrist, you can still fl flex your wrist up pretty high because of that those relieved edges on the case. The watch is running an STP 111 movement in it. Um, STP, uh, as many of you probably already know, Zodiac is now and has been since uh, 2001, I believe, a member of the fossil group. And STP is fossil's own uh, Swiss mechanical movement manufacturer. The movement in the watch, the STP-111, is very, very similar to the ETA-2824-2, which is found in uh, most Swiss luxury three-hand watches, uh, which aren't using in-house movements. It does have one additional jewel. Uh, the STP-111 features 26 jewels as opposed to the ETA 2824-2's 25 joules. But otherwise, it's a virtually identical movement. There are some small differences here and there, but I think even some parts will interchange. Don't quote me on that. Um, and it beats at the same uh, rate of 28,800 beats per hour, so you've got a nice, smoothly sweeping second hand STP's movements have acquired a pretty good reputation for accuracy and robustness. I think there were some initial quality control problems with their very early movements, but if you read reviews written by professional reviewers um, nowadays, uh, the general consensus seems to be that the STP-111 is even a bit 
better finished than the ETA 2824-2. So it is a big watch. It's fairly heavy. Um, it does feature a natural rubber strap, which is reminiscent of the old Tropic styles or isofrane. It's got this slanted isofrane end on here. Uh, when it's closed, it when it's closed around the wrist, it looks very much like a uh, traditional buckled strap. But in fact, it does feature a deployment clasp, as you can see here, uh, which works very nicely. Um, one thing you'll notice if when you get your hands on one of these is this rubber strap is made in Italy. And sort of a defining characteristic of high-grade rubber, natural rubber straps made in Italy is they smell like vanilla. They actually incorporate some sort of vanilla oil or extract into the formula for the rubber. And when I first took the watch out of the uh, out of its box the smell was almost overpowering I mean really cloying smell of rubber and some people have complained about this some people have tried all different types of things to uh, reduce that vanilla smell I haven't done anything to it the smell has faded over time but uh, the general feeling is you're never going to really get rid of that uh, vanilla smell entirely because it's in the rubber formula. Uh, and if you hate the smell of vanilla, you may end up hating, uh, well, you're certainly going to end up hating this watch strap. You may end up hating the watch. Of course, you can always put some other sort of strap on there. The strap itself is very nice. It's got a little bit of stretch to it, and it's very, very flexible. It almost feels more like uh, silicone or something like that. The natural rubber strap on this Victorinox Inox, for instance, um, is quite stiff by comparison. Um, you can see it's it's actually quite stiff. It'll take a set and then slowly stretch out. Um, this is a very very tough strap, but it's not nearly so supple or luxurious, I hate to call any rubber luxurious, but the strap on the Zodiac really is quite luxurious feeling. Uh, of course it features a sapphire crystal. I've been wearing this watch uh, for about a year. I've been wearing it to wa work in a machine shop. I've been wearing it to work at my maintenance job outdoors. And it's acquired a few small scuff marks around this compression ring that uh, holds the bezel on. But other than that, it's really held up quite nicely and the, uh, the sapphire crystal is not scratched at all. The bezel ring also features a, an inlaid insert, uh, which some people have said is also sapphire. It is not, uh, at least Zodiac doesn't claim that it is. It's supposedly uh, hardened mineral crystal, similar to, um, uh, Seiko's Hardlex, for instance, that also has not acquired any scratches over the course of the last year. The bezel ring itself is kind of interesting, and it's one of the defining characteristics of the original Zodiac Super Seawolf, and uh, this model is an accurate reproduction thereof. And it's unique, well not unique, but it's unusual in that it locks in place. You cannot inadvertently turn the bezel ring. Um, you actually have to depress the bezel ring, push it down, and then you can turn it only in an anti-clockwise manner. It's uh, unidirectional. Um, it only has 60 clicks, so it's not a 120 click bezel, but it's very positive, uh, very smooth, and it really clicks in with some authority. I like it very much, and I like the fact that you really cannot inadvertently turn this bezel ring. Even if it got pushed down on one side and you tried to turn it, it will not move. So, that's nice. Um, the watch features a solid case back, which is nice. There's no reason um, for having an exhibition case back over a, uh, an ETA 2824-2 clone. Uh, the Zodiac symbol is D 
deeply etched into the back. Um, very solid. It looks like a bank vault door. Um, the Zodiac logo also appears on the deployment clasp buckle. Um, you've got Zodiac on the keeper and 1882 date also on the keeper inside and out um, there's a zodiac emblem there on the inside of the back of the strap um, and the zodiac name on the inside of that strap end so that's pretty much the watch cosmetically um, we do have the Zodiac symbol here on the dial with Zodiac Super Seawolf in script font. That's been one of the complaints about this watch is that it has four separate fonts in two different colors uh, on the dial. But that is, Zodiac is known for its sort of funky styling. This is uh, not an exact reproduction of the Super Seawolf uh, 750s dial from 1968, but it's very, very similar. And the fonts are the same, although they're, uh, it's worded slightly differently. But uh, I like it. It is funky, but uh, fun nonetheless. Of course, you've got this orange chapter ring uh, inside the case with the minute train printed on it and a simple date with, of course, no Cyclops. Um, now, this sapphire crystal is dead flat on this watch. On the original Zodiac Super Seawolf, I believe the watch had an acrylic crystal. Uh, it might have been glass. I believe it was acrylic, and it was slightly domed. So that's a little bit different than the original. Now, the original very distinctive case of the Zodiac Super Seawolf 750, as introduced in 1968, was actually one of the super compressor cases made by the Swiss manufacturer EPSA. And EPSA is an acronym for Irvin Picare SA. Uh, it was very common practice uh, back before uh, the late 60s for watch companies to buy uh, factory cases and then assemble watches sometimes using somebody else's movement, using somebody else's case, and assembling the whole watch uh, and timing it and putting their own branding on it. And EPSA Super Compressor cases appeared on many different watches over the years. And this particular EPSA Super Compressor case uh, was not just used on the original Zodiac Super Seawolf 750, but it was used on several other watches. I did a little bit of research looking at images of 1960s vintage Swiss dive watches, and I identified, in addition to the Zodiac Super Seawolf 750, also the Blanc Palm 50 Fathoms 1000, uh, the SEMA Diving Star 1500, and uh, Zenith made a dive watch. I'm not sure of the model name, um, but there's one particular version of the dive watch which is known colloquially as the Big Lemon. So if you Google Zenith Big Lemon, you'll see that dive watch, although it was also made in a couple of other colors. The Big Lemon is obviously all yellow. Um, so this particular case was not unique to the Zodiac Super Seawolf 750, but the Super Seawolf was certainly um, the best recognized watch and uh, certainly I think the only watch today that's being made in a case uh, that's dimensionally the same as that original Epsa Super Compressor case. Now the Epsa Super Compressor uh, watches, dive watches, were unique in that they featured a, a sort of spring-loaded floating case back which was not unlike in in principle it was it was completely different in uh, how it performed the job but it was not unlike in principle the idea uh, used in the uh, Vostok amphibian dive watches in that as water pressure increases and applies more pressure to the case back 
the case back actually moves in compressing the seals and increasing water resistance. And I was interested to know uh, Zodiac claims that they uh, reproduced the original uh, Super Siebel 750 case uh, using uh, original examples in their reference collection. Uh, but they don't, they're not really clear about whether or not this new case incorporates that super compressor technology or not. And so regarding my questions about the actual construction of the new Super Seawolf 68's case, I did contact Zodiac's press office and I actually received a very prompt and a clearly personalized response to my questions from a woman at Zodiac's press office and she did answer my questions sort of. She basically just gave me the information that was already available to me in the press materials that Zodiac released at the time they released the watch. She told me that they had taken original examples of the Super Seawolf from their reference collection and basically reverse engineered their own design to reproduce the watch and they beefed up the water resistance from 750 meters to 1000 meters and all that other wonderful stuff. But she clearly didn't really understand what I was asking. Uh, I didn't follow up because I didn't figure I was going to get a definitive answer. Um, so the only really definitive way for us to know whether or not what's inside that watch case matches what is on EPSA's super compressor patent drawings is for me to saw the case in half while it's assembled and look at it in cross-section. Now, I am clearly not going to saw my own Christmas present in half, but if on the off chance, and I have no illusions that this is going to happen, but on the off chance that somebody from Zodiac sees this video and wants to end the, the, uh, the uh, speculation about how their watch case is constructed, I would be more than happy to. If you want to send me a Super Seawolf case, it doesn't have to be obviously first quality. It could be a blemish or a, a factory second, whatever you want to call it. Not a whole watch, just the case. Send it to me and I will very happily saw it in half on the cold saw on video. I'll show myself sawing the case in half and we'll look at it in cross section and see if it matches EPSA's patent drawings. At least basically, obviously, I'm not going to divulge any uh, of your corporate secrets or take any really exact measurements in the video, but I would love to know if that's an actual super compressor case, even though it's not made by EPSA. And so whether or not the Zodiac Sea Wolf features that super compressor technology, it does have a water resistance rating of 1,000 meters, and that's pretty impressive regardless of how they did it. 1,000 um, meter dive watches are by no means rare today. You can find them in watches as inexpensive as this uh, Deep Blue Sun Diver, which sells for just a few hundred dollars, but it's still pretty amazing. Um, that we've got watches of relatively affordable watches today that are water resistant to depths of a thousand meters. Um, looking at this watch reminds me that the Zodiac Super Seawolf 68 saturation features the same plongeur style hand set that the original did in 1968. One of the reasons I bought this Deep Blue Sun Diver uh, several, well, quite a few years ago now, um, was that it, I was such a big Zodiac fan and the handset was very reminiscent of that found on the Zodiac Super Seawolf. At least the minute hand has that same uh, plongeur style uh, that I find so appealing. And uh, this is another watch I really love. Uh, I don't know that I'll ever do a, a whole video on it, but it's a great watch and it kind of gave me that Zodiac Super Seawolf feel uh, before I could go out and buy a brand new Super Seawolf. Um, in other ways, it kind of resembles, uh, most of you, many of you will have noticed it, it sort of resembles uh, the older version of the RS Aquas. So it's a mashup of various design features, but it's a pretty cool watch also. Anyway, um, 
so I guess I don't really have a whole lot else to add. Um, I think we should wrap this up because this is probably getting pretty long, but uh, I just love this watch. I'm so glad that Zodiac is producing uh, some of these classic designs again, and I hope that they continue with this into the future. Let's wrap it up. So this is probably getting super long, and what you're watching right now has probably already had a ton of stuff edited out of it because I don't even know how much time I've spent filming today. Uh, but I want to wrap this up with a couple of observations. First of all, I love the Zodiac Super Seawolf 68 saturation, and I'd like to say thank you to my lovely wife for such a thoughtful Christmas present last year. I think it's a really cool watch. Um, I actually hope that uh, Zodiac doesn't become completely dependent on watch designs from the past. I'd love to see them developing some new innovative uh, watch designs that would uh, kind of push them forward into the 21st century. But I love my Super Seawolf 68 saturation and I think it's a really well built watch. Um, I think it's a great movement inside of it. It's clearly well built. And as I pointed out earlier in the video, Zodiac watches have always represented a remarkable value compared to the competition. Um, the Zodiac Seawolf and Super Seawolf still today sell for considerably less than a lot of their competitors. Uh, I did a little bit of research and I apologize, this is about a year old so the prices have probably changed a little bit. But I looked at my watch, the Super Seawolf 68 saturation. I looked at the specifications of it and the fact that mine is mounted on a rubber strap and I wanted to find something that was roughly equivalent uh, to the Super Seawolf uh, and look for what was also probably the least expensive equivalent watch. What I came up with was at the time the Breitling Super Ocean 2 44. Um, this one is reference number A1739-2D8 and it's the model mounted on a rubber strap. Um, very similar in a lot of ways. As I said, it's on a rubber strap. It also has a water resistance rating of a thousand meters and um, I believe this one's running a variation of the um, ETA 2824-2 in it so roughly equivalent movements and the price on the Breitling Super Ocean 244 is $3,650. In contrast my watch has a retail price of $1,495 so that's an enormous difference in price even though Zodiac's roots run much deeper when it comes to dive watches than Breitling's do. Um, even though it's still made in Switzerland, even though it's a very highly regarded brand, it's less than half the price of the, Zodi uh, the uh, Breitling Super Ocean 2 44. And I know some of you are probably going, yes, but the Breitling Super Ocean 2 44 is chronometer certified it's going to be more accurate than your Zodiac Super Seawolf. That's true enough. But ironically, there is a chronometer certified version of the Zodiac Super Seawolf 68 saturation. It's the limited edition 50th anniversary watch set, which is not only chronometer certified, it comes with an auxiliary, uh, it comes on a shark mesh bracelet, it comes with an auxiliary uh, tropic style rubber strap and a velcro nylon strap and all of that comes packaged in a leather watch roll I'm not going to put that up on the screen but here it is and that whole set chronometer certified so really the Breitling doesn't have any advantage whatsoever over this watch plus this has some extras sells for $1,995 so that's still almost $1,700 less than the Breitling Super Ocean 2 44. As a matter of fact, I did a little mathematics here. So if you add the standard Super Seawolf 68 
that I have at 1495 and the 50th anniversary Super Sea Wolf, which is chronometer certified at $1,995. You add those together, they add up for to $3,490, which is $160 less than the Breitling Super Ocean 2 44. So, I mean, those numbers are pretty tough to argue with. So, as you can see, I'm a big fan of the Super Seawolf 68 saturation. I hope I haven't bored you to death with this video. I hope some of you have found it interesting. Uh, if you have, please consider subscribing to the channel. If you liked it, click the like button down below. If you hated it, if you thought it was too long and too long-winded, click the dislike button. You guys know the drill. Share, tell your friends. Um, and when I post new content to the channel, I hope to see each of you here then. Later, guys. <laughs>